What we're going to do, what I'd like to do this, uh, for this session is let's focus on the, the 23 themes. So this is a bit of an introduction to the artisan teacher. And what we'll do is talk a little bit about where these themes came from, talk a little bit about the research that produced them, talk a little bit about how they're organized. And then what I'd really like to do is to spend a little bit of time going into a couple of the themes uh, kind of from the perspective of, okay, if I were observing a classroom, what does this one look like? So that I can really kind of up my observation skills and, uh, and, and go with that. Uh, what I might do to, to get us started, though, is to simply say uh, the 23 themes of the artisan teacher uh, are built on this notion that it is more efficient and effective and it is more optimizing of our time to spot and develop a teacher's talents rather than first and foremost think about a teacher's liabilities and weaknesses. I, I hope we, we're clear that that doesn't mean we ignore them. We certainly can't do that. That'd be malpractice. But to spend too much of our time working on people's 15% means we don't have as much time left to work on their 50%. And if we're after incre increased teaching quality, that could be a strategic error. Um, how do you feel about that? Anything before we get into the nuts and bolts of the themes? Is there something that you'd like to add or ask, does anybody want to say anything like, but gosh, that's wimpy, or that's not tough enough, or what about the derelicts, or anything like that? Did you want to say that? No, you don't say that. <laughs> but I just wanted to, just based on this morning's conversation about why that's an important concept, if there's just some things we could respond to that before we get started, that'd be great. What were you going to add? Thank you. Um, I was going to ask. You know, uh, so I guess you heard that. So do you think it's possible that a person could go into the field of teaching and graduate and get a job and not have very many of the talents that are necessary to be a teacher? Let's admit that's possible, isn't it? People are attracted to education for a number of reasons. Some of them have to do with good vacations and benefits and my mother was a teacher and, and uh, you know, that's, so it's possible that that's true. I'd like to go on record as saying, I don't know that I've ever met a teacher that had no talents, but I've met several that their weaknesses greatly outnumbered their talents and it probably would have been good guidance for them to have chosen another career because it's going to be a real uphill slog for you even to be competent, much less awesome and great and produce student achievement. So, uh, so I suppose the only response to that is, yeah, that's true, but as an administrator, let's not be quick to say this teacher has, does not have enough talent to be at my school. Let's get good at spotting and maybe we could say, if I could find a couple of things that I could build on, now I have a foothold and perhaps we can help this person. I have to say, just as a person who works a lot with teachers and coaching them, there are many, many examples of teachers who are really struggling, who based on their talents, worked their way out of it and became really, really, I'm not gonna say they will ever be teacher of the year, but they became better than competent. They became people that you would say, you're a keeper. You know, I want you on my faculty. If I could sign you to a lifetime contract, I, I would. So it's our ability to spot talents. You know, the themes that are on that card, it's kind of interesting about spotting talents. You, it's hard to spot something that you don't know to exist, right? So the more of these themes you're familiar with, the more of them you can spot in the work of a teacher. So if you, for instance, looking at your card, if you were really understood chunking very well. Chunking is the talent of the teacher for being able to take something really complicated and break it down into small pieces so the students don't get overwhelmed. Some people have a real natural gift at that. Don't you think some teachers have the anti-talent to chunking? They take simple things and lump them together so they're so complex that nobody can understand where they're going. So, but if you found, if you knew that chunking existed, then it's kind of, it's easier to see it when you go into classrooms. So that's why part of being a a great talent scout and developer as an administrator, I think, is doing our homework. Let's know what we're looking for. Let's know what these things are because if we don't know they exist, it's hard to spot them. Um, anyone else have something you would add or ask just about the general approach of turning teacher talent into student achievement? So, I, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah thanks. So many of us in here are turnaround schools, and so yeah, thanks a lot. Many of us in here are turnaround schools, so we have uh, a set time frame to get results. Right. So how do you work with not just the schools, but with the districts to help support and coach, help develop yeah. that talent? Right. We, we have the pressure of turning right. things around fairly quickly. Right. So yeah. do you do work with districts? Yes, absolutely, and I know this is probably a, an unsatisfactory response, but working on talents is the fastest way to develop teachers, without a doubt. And it's a perfect match for people who are busy like school administrators. Here's what takes a long time, supervising teachers and helping them correct their weaknesses. That takes, that's a big time window. If you could discover that a teacher had a really good talent for performance feedback and develop that out, not only is that something that can be done in a period of weeks or months and not years, here's the other thing I like about working with teachers based on their talents. I don't have to be such a good coach. You know, basically all I have to do is call to their attention and give them a few tools and if it's a talent, they run with it. Now if you're working with a teacher in an area where he or she is weak, you better have your coaching skills on because you're going to have to say everything right and it's going to have to be documented and you're going to have to do all those things. So in a way, this is not only more positive, uh, it's faster, right? And, uh, and, and over time, uh, in a turnaround school, the thing that's going to happen to turn things around is that TQ is going to go up. Teaching quality's got to go up. How fast can it go up? So by working with this, you, you get the talent of the folks that you have going up quickly. And then, like we said, the culture of your school becomes such that people start saying, I'd like to come and work for you. I've heard that talented people can go there and, and build their skills. And I know it's a tough place. I know you've got some challenges, but I'd like to be a part of that. You know, that'd be a cool thing to have, wouldn't it? Anything else? All right, let's go to work on, uh, if you look at your card, let me uh, just give you a little introduction to that. What you have there are 23 themes of teaching talent. Uh, I said this morning, here's where the 23 themes come from. Based on uh, upwards of 35,000 classroom observations, just taking copious notes at what teachers do that are effective, these are the 23 most often seen recurring themes of effective instruction. These are not the only 23. These are not uh, your favorite 23. They're just the 23 that what? That recur most often. So if you were to go into a number of classrooms, what you see on that list, it has to have a cutoff somewhere. These are the things that you see uh, the most often. They recur from classroom to classroom. There are some talents that teachers have that are unique. I've been in a few teachers' classrooms, and they do things that I don't see anyone else do, and that's their style, and that's what makes them work, and there's nothing on the card to help them. But, for, but what's on that card are things you could expect to see in just about any classroom that you went into. Now here's how you get on the card. You have to qualify in four ways. Number one, you have to be grade level neutral. So every theme on that card is kindergarten through 12. It are, there are no early childhood themes, there are no secondary themes. These things have to be seen in the classrooms of young children, middle school, high school. Number two, you have to be subject area neutral. There are no themes on there that are aimed only at literacy. There are no themes on there that are aimed only at science. They have to be useful for orchestra, PE, band, shop, English, civics, everything. Number three, there has to be a research base in the literature behind everything that's on that card. So these can't just be things we saw in a teacher's classroom on a Tuesday afternoon, but there's no evidence in, in, the, in the literature that they, it exists anywhere else. So you'll notice as you read down those things, there's not a thing on the, either side of that card that you haven't already heard about or read about or, or seen research in literature on. So it has to be, there has to be a research base behind it. And then maybe number four is the one that I'm the most committed to is, even though these are research based, they don't come from research, they come from practice. So these have to be observed in the classrooms of already successful, talented teachers. They can't be theoretical. These aren't things that the research suggests the teachers should do. These have to be things that when you go into your best teachers, you look at this and you say, there it is, I see it, I see it, I see it, I see it. So they're observational. 
I don't know about you, but one of the things that, that I struggle with as a, as a developer of teachers is that sometimes to get teachers to look at, at doing new things, uh, it occurs to them that maybe they aren't, what they're doing now isn't sufficient. So you kind of have to say, I'm doing something wrong to learn how to do something right. What most teachers resonate with on the list is we say, look, this is a list of things you're likely already doing. We want to bring it to your attention. We want to we fill in the research base behind it. We, we've noticed you have knacks for this. Let's really look at what it is. Most people are pretty willing to give some work to developing out something they think they already have. Most people resist you adding something that you've suggested that is missing from their, from their repertoire. So in a way, that's, uh, that can be one as well. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, structure to the 23. So look at the side of the card that starts with clear learning goals. All right, There's two sides. They're not numbered one and two. But one of them starts with clear learning goals. There are three subsets of talent themes on this card. The first set is the first six. And so the first six, I would call, these are the fundamentals. They are the oldest. They are the ones that have been in the research the longest. So look at those first six. Clear learning goals, congruency, diagnosis, task analysis, overt responses, mid-course corrections. These have been around with us since Horace Mann laid the first log in the first schoolhouse up in Massachusetts, right? These, and the reason these are so research-based is they've been around so long, there have been a lot of studies on them. So these are what we call fundamental talents. Uh, do you believe that some teachers can be more talented than others on goal clarity? Have you seen that? Some people just think that way. They, they get to work in the morning and they say, here's my standard, here's my goal, and it just occurs to me, here's exactly what I'm going to do to help kids reach that goal. Other teachers are great teachers. They have wonderful activities, but they lose track of their goal orientation. Right? doesn't mean that they can't be a great teacher. It just means the goal part isn't as natural a talent for them. So I like to say these first six are required whether you have a talent for them or not. So, you know, you, I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? You can't say, gosh, you know, I went to this, this cool thing out in Phoenix and I learned that you ought to go with your talents and I'm not very talented in standards-based instruction, so I'm just going to not go with that. I think I'll, you know, no, you can't do that, right? You have, to, you have to be good at these. That'd be like a surgeon saying, you know, I'm really good at surgery except for I don't have a steady hand. You know, I'm sorry, that's kind of a disqualifier for the rest of your talents. You better take some pills or something, because if you don't have a steady hand, you can't operate on people. That's a non-option. So these first six, as an administrator, I would, I would suggest that you consider these to be talents, but they're talents that if someone doesn't have them, they're still responsible for being able to be competent in these areas. They are the fundamentals. They are the six teacher skills over the years that are the most linked to student achievement. There's more data and more research on these six than, than, than anything else that we know of. So the first six, we'll call those the fundamentals. Then, although they're not denoted any differently on your card, the next 12 form a group. The next 12, uh, I like to think of these as optimizers. An optimizer is a talent that is not required. I would suggest that these next 12, so when I say the next 12, here's what I'm talking about. We're looking, we're starting with conscious attention, chunking, connection, practice, personal relevance, locale memory, mental models, going to the backside, first time learning, neural downshifting, enriched environments, success, and performance feedback. That's the next set. Those are talents and teaching abilities that I would suggest we approach teachers in this way. Find the two or three of these that you're the most adept at and lean on those. We would never expect a teacher to do all 12 of these in a lesson. It'd be too confusing. It'd be like too many spices in a dish. It would, they'd cancel each other out. So unlike the, the fundamentals, the optimizers, we add two or three at a time depending on what your, what your talents are. What your, what, your, what your knack is for these things. Now that leaves, what, five more. 
And the last five, I'll call those maximizers. They're the most optional. They really kind of come from the art of teaching. So now we're talking about the last five, which are stagecraft, complementary elements, time and timing, personal presence, and delight. Six, 12, five, non-options. Choose the ones that you're the most talented at. These, these are choice too. You know, we'd probably not call a teacher in their office and shut the door and, and, and say, we're gonna have a really uh, difficult conversation with you because in your career, I just don't see enough stagecraft. You know, that would probably not be something we'd ever do. That would be a conversation, I don't see standards, I don't see goal clarity, but, but not stagecraft. If this is helpful, this is a metaphor that helps me understand how these three sets work together. Um, think of the first six as, let's use a home building metaphor. This is the foundation, and it is the framing and the roof of the house. So it's a solid foundation, it is the walls, and it is the roof of the house. Think of the 12 optimizers as the floor plan. How the rooms are arranged, how much space there is in the kitchen, how the kitchen connects to the living room how much space is in the opening foyer, all of these things, they optimize what? The foundation of the house. You could live in a house that just had a foundation and, and the outside walls and a roof, right? Fundamentally, you could make it work. But the optimizers, that's where an architect goes in and says, oh, we're gonna create this entrance and then the traffic flow is gonna go this way and then we're gonna have the sun come up in the morning into the bedrooms, we're gonna have the sun set in the backyard over the garden. I mean, that's your floor plan. The five maximizers. That's your paint and your furniture, right? So that's, that's what, you, those are the finishing touches you put on your house to make it not only solid and not only well designed, but to make it aesthetically beautiful. So this is your paint, this is your, your, your pictures, this is your interior design work, your drapes, your rugs, your color schemes. So do you see that as I work with teachers, you would never work with a teacher's paint color if they had needs in their structure or their floor plan, right? That's kind of how, how those six go. So as, a, as, a, as an administrator who's wanting to build the maximum amount of teaching quality in my school, I'm looking at these six a little differently. I'm looking at these 12 as my next line of, of optimization. And then quite honestly, those last five, that's, that's not what helps a teacher become competent. I'd say that's not even what helps a teacher go from good to great. That's what we can help teachers who are already great go to the level of unforgettable or legendary. You know, that's, and if you have a teacher who already has a solid foundation and already has a great floor plan in their little house of teaching, one of the most fun things to do as an administrator is help them, what? Help them redecorate. Help them add some of the maximizers to their, uh, to the list. Now, in Artisan Teacher, the reason we call it Artisan Teacher is because here's the definition that I like to use of an artisan. You know, an artisan, that's kind of a popular word these days. Uh, artisan cheese, artisan bread, artisan jewelry. You know, artisan basically is the same thing you can get at the grocery store, although it costs more. So that's what it means, I think. Um, I wish artisan wasn't used that way. I really like to go back to the original definition of artisan. An artisan is, is a skilled craftsperson. An artisan, you know, in, in the first definition of artisan, is a coppersmith, is a stonemason, is, uh, you know, is, a, is a carpenter, is a, is a jewelry maker, is a baker, right? Is a cheese maker. There's probably a better word than cheese maker. What are cheese makers called? If bread makers are called bakers, what are cheese makers called? That's not a rhetorical question. What are they? <laughs> the Monroe Cheesemakers. Well, then it's Cheesemakers. My God, let's give some authority to that title now. Here we go. So as we look at, at the artisan class and, and how teachers are artisans, what we uh, identify is that an artisan is part scientist, part artist, and part skilled laborer. So take an artisan pastry chef. They're, they're a scientist. They understand the chemistry of, of pastry. They're also an artist. They know how to add certain things that make their pastries 
better than something you could buy mass produced at the grocery store. But artisans aren't just theorists. They are workers. They've got flour on their apron. They've got, they've got you know, uh, the, the metalsmith has metal shards on their apron. That's the way I think great teachers are. They're scientists. They know brain research. They're artists. They're, they add their style to their teaching. But you know, a great teacher comes early and stays late and produces a product, don't you think? I mean, we, we got learning going out the door. So we're like, hey, I'm an artisan baker. I don't actually bake any bread. I just talk about it. No, you know, a teacher is a worker. There's a technical core to that. Now, let me just quickly say that those three things that are underlined up there correspond to these six, and these 12, and these five. The first six, that's the work of teaching. The next 12, that's the science of teaching. And the next five, that's the what? The art of teaching. So it's just another way of understanding how the 23 how the 23 themes came to be. 23, I know that's a big number. I wish it was simpler. I wish I could stand up here today and say, we've done a bunch of research on this, and the good news is there's just three things great teachers do. The fact of the matter is, great teaching is complicated. It's sophisticated. It is not easy. Great teachers are not cut from the same mold. They, there is no template for it. There are great teachers who have a-type personalities and who have B-type personalities. There are great teachers who are hyper-focused, and there are some really awesome, completely ADD teachers, right? There's, there's just not a template for it. There is a, I wish there were, if you wanted to study how teachers are ineffective, that would be a shorter study. There's, there are only about five or six major ways teachers fail. One of them is they don't seem to appear to like to be around other human beings. Right? That's sort of a non-starter for that. But if you want to study teaching excellence, you kind of do have to bring a lunch and stay for a while because there are, there are a number of, of things. So I wish it had come out to be a better number. 12 would have been good, or 10, or 7. That's a classic number. 23. Who thought that up? Fromagers. What's that? Cheesemakers. Fromage, say it again. Fromagers. Fromagers. Write that down. <laughs> Optionally. Cheesemaker. Doesn't sound as good as cheesemaker, does it? Um, 23 is not unprecedented, though. There are some famous athletes who have worn the number 23. Anyone know of any? Michael Jordan from my home state of North Carolina was 23. Anyone here like Dr. Pepper? How many flavors are in Dr. Pepper? 23. That's right. There are 23 flavors in a Dr. Pepper. That's right. So I'm just trying to give you some reason to latch on to this idea that there are, that there are 23 themes. Uh, okay. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is take the card, and you're sitting at a table with a couple of other people, one or two or three others. And so what I'd like to do is you to just scan the card front and back based on the structure that we've just seen, and then um, just share. Uh, Gosh, if I had to have the rest of the time that we had, if there was one of the themes that I'd really like to hear some more about, what would it be? I want you to share that with your table. We'll do a little multi-vote here in just a moment, and we'll see which of the themes we can use. I'd like to take the rest of our time and go into some of the individual themes and give you a feel for what they look like in the classroom. So, um, and I've got some that I'd like to share with you no matter what you ask for, but I'd like to have some of them that are kind of by request. So take two minutes, look at the card, share with the people at your table which ones you're most interested in. Okay, here we go. Let's do, um, let's do snaps this time. You know how to snap? 
So let's do double snaps because if you just do single snaps, sometimes you miss. You know, a thud. So double snaps. Try it. Let's try it together. Everyone's going to do a double snap. One, two, three. Let's try it again in unison. One, two, three. All right, good. So I'm going to go through the list, and when I get to the one you are the most interested in, I want you to give me a double snap. Okay? And we're just going to listen in, and we'll kind of see. Uh, we'll kind of see how it uh, see how it goes. Here we go. Clear learning goals, congruency, task analysis, diagnosis, overt responses, mid-course corrections, conscious attention, chunking, connection, practice, personal relevance, locale memory, mental models, first time learning. Neural downshifting, enriched environments, success, performance feedback, stagecraft, complementary elements, time and timing, personal presence, delight. Okay, now some of you are waiting for other ones for choices to give me a snack. That's all the choices that you have in being able to do that. All right, I've got a couple that that's narrowed down to then. Let's see. Let's start with um, let's start with connection. All right. So you you have your card. Uh, so you know some people can just listen and it makes sense and they don't need to take notes. I'm going to give you a couple of things to write down up here on the flip chart. So if you have a blank piece of paper and you want to jot a few things down, that might help. But it's optional, right? You know your own learning style. Connection is the talent of the teacher for taking what he or she wants to teach. And instead of teaching it directly, they teach it by connecting it back to a past learning or experience. So they say, how can I teach you by connecting this to what you already know, rather than how can I teach you? Um, Piaget is the person in educational and curriculum development that gave us the term schema, right? A schema is a mental framework. It's, it's several thousand to several million neurons that work together to construct a meaning of, around something. So we have schema. So here's how connection works. Connection is a powerful talent. Oh, this is a, a wonderful talent to have as a teacher. Connection works by, by uh, optimizing this process called schema building. S-C-H-E-M-A, schema. There are two ways to teach. Number one, start a new schema. Number two, build onto a, an old schema. Number two is faster, better, deeper, and stronger. That's just basically how it works. Now, connection, and I'm giving you some information on some of the themes. This is optional. Don't feel compelled to write all this down. There are four of the 12 optimizers that are in the research that have a similar vein. They are the things that when teachers use these four, three things happen. Speed, recall, and transfer. So speed is the, the uh, acquisition speed of learning. Recall is, of course, the student's ability to remember what we've taught them. And by the way, recall means recall without review. Anyone can recall if the teacher takes enough time to review it. We're talking about recall without having to have a review sheet that you go through. And then the third is called transfer, which is the ability of the student to learn it in one setting and then use it in a new setting, which is really the purpose of education, right? Not just to do well on a test, but to be able to use it. So transfer is you learn it on Tuesday and you use it on Wednesday. Or you learn it in third grade and you use it in seventh. Or you learn it in school, but you use it at home. So in school, you learn the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and write triangles. And then you go to Home Depot to buy a ladder to clean out your gutters, and it dawns on you that the size of the ladder you need can be calculated without actually measuring it because it's the hypotenuse of the side of the wall and how far you want to bring it out from the base. And so that's going to Home Depot and using your education. That's transfer. And the reason that you want to be able to do that is they price ladders by the what? by the foot. The longer the ladder, the more you have to pay. So you don't want a longer ladder than you need. That's what we mean by transfer. Now I know I'm talking fast, I know it's a lot of numbers. There are four of the 12 that do these three. Was that confusing enough? Here they are, in case you want to know. Connection, locale memory, personal relevance, and mental models. 
connection, locale memory, personal relevance, and mental models. Those four optimizers have something in common. They, they increase these three things. They all increase the speed of learning, the recall without review, and the transferability. And that's a pretty good triple threat. So these are high performing talents that you chose. By the way, the other ones that I heard a lot of snaps on was locale memory, which is another one of those four, right? So connection is schema building. If I were going to draw a picture of connection, this would be the picture I would draw. I would draw a little memory cloud. In the middle of it, I'd put PLE. That stands for, what do you think? Past, learning, and experience. And then I would put a C up here. This stands for content or curriculum. So connection is the ability of the teacher to take the content and to connect it to a PLE, to build on something that's already there. And when the teacher does that, you're, you're adding on to a pre-existing schema rather than building a new schema. That does speed, recall, and transfer. By the way, neuroscientists tell us that the reason that happens is that whenever a new schema is built, the first few hundred thousand neurons that connect to build a brand new schema connect slowly and with greater energy than subsequent neurons that connect in. So the first few thousand neurons are slow and painful to put together. But after you have a few hundred thousand neurons, the next few thousand that jump on do so quickly at a low energy level. And so that's why it increases speed, recall, and transfer to build on something that, that students already know. So in the Karate Kid movie, Mr. Miyagi had Daniel-san go out the night before and wax his car, right? Wax on, wax off, so that the next day he could build on that schema and teach him two martial arts moves on how to block incoming kicks from your right and from your left right, that deflect it that way, and daniel Son said, Mr. Miyagi, I came here to learn martial arts, you've got me waxing your car. He was a pretty good teacher though, wasn't he? Because he was setting up a connection. He said, we're going to get to the martial arts part, right now I'm building a schema in your brain, and I'm going to connect back to it the next day. That's how schema, that's how connection works. I was watching a, 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 a elementary school teacher teaching subtraction and regrouping and the students came in for their lesson and in the middle of every cooperative learning table were four green felt hats with little feathers on them and before they started the lesson she turned on the smart board and showed them about a three or four minute video clip of Robin Hood and his merry men you know and and uh, Maid Marian and who was the bad guy the sheriff of Nottingham right remember the story Robin Hood now why was she showing them Robin Hood and why were they wearing green hats because Robin Hood did what stole from the rich to the poor, which is what subtraction with regrouping is, right? It's stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And so when she started teaching them regrouping, she said, this is Robin Hood, Robin Hood, right? And they put their hats on and they did it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, um, you had to go to Walmart last night. You had to buy all this felt, make these hats, get this feather. You, you're, you're already seven minutes behind the classroom down the road because all they did was start with a worksheet on how to subtract with regrouping. But it's a tortoise and hare story, isn't it? Because eventually the first teacher is going to catch up to and pass the second teacher because now kids are learning by building onto pre-existing schemas that they, that they already have. That's how connection works. The seventh grade social studies teacher was teaching three branches of the federal government, uh, executive, judicial, and legislative. And, and instead of just teaching them straight away, had the students participate in a little tournament of paper, rock, scissors first. He connected the three branches of the federal government to paper, rock, scissors, right? He said the legislative branch is paper. It passes bills. The judicial branch is scissors. It can declare things unconstitutional. The, the uh, executive branch is the rock, right? Think of a paperweight on the president's desk, the rock. And he really showed how paper, rock, scissors are a perfect balance of power because what? Paper beats rock, scissors beats paper, but rock beats scissors. It kind of makes you think what the Founding Fathers may have been doing up in Philadelphia <laughs> when they were setting up the federal government, right? I asked the teacher, uh, this was a teacher in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I asked him, I said, that's a novel way of doing that. I've never seen that before. I said, tell me, does it help? Do they, can they remember it better that way? And he said, you know, Mike, I really think they can. What I notice is, like, later on this year, when I bring this back up and we build on it and go deeper, they're able to just bring it right back because they remember the paper, rock, scissors. What was he doing? Taking the content he wanted to teach, and instead of just teaching them directly, 
Now, don't you remember learning this? How did you learn the three branches of the federal government? I, I learned it on a worksheet. I think it was matching or flashcards or something like that. Now, I remember back in the day, some of you are, uh, some of you are similar in age to me, but I, I think it was a simpler time when worksheets had a good smell to them. Anyone remember that time? <laughs> right? That's right. That's uh, you know, spirit duplicators. There's, there are teachers today that have no idea what this is. You know, that's, I think we all got along better back in those days, to be honest with you. I think because we were all half high on inhalants the whole time. Teacher had a bad attitude, just put them in the spirit duplicating room for a few minutes and everything was good after that. Do you remember being a kid in school? And this will tell your age a little bit, but there's nothing better than getting one and it's still a little moist. Yes, and you smell it and you get going. Yes. Things didn't get any better than that. That's right. Now, I'm thinking, so you can teach this on a worksheet, build a new schema, or you can teach it by connecting back to a pre-existing schema. Connection is the talent of the teacher for, for making this, for connecting back and doing it, and doing it in that way. Um, there it was a, uh, I was w watching an, an orchestra teacher once, and she was teaching students how to use the whole bow. The, the violin and the cello, because they were kind of just sawing in the middle. She goes, no, you got to use the whole bow back and forth, and you got to feel go all the way to the edge. She goes, have you ever been to the edge of like a, of, of like a, like up on the Blue Ridge Parkway? This was up in, in the mountains of North Carolina. You know, and you kind of look out over and you get that, that kind of feeling like you're about to fall off. She goes, I want you to get that feeling. When you pull the bow across, I want it to feel like you're right on the edge of a precipice. And you know what? It worked. It was, it was back and forth and it worked. And, and they started playing with more, she called it more amplitude, I think. And it did sound a lot better. Then she got on the violins and the cellos for playing at the same time. She said, look, she goes, this piece of music requires the violins to be quiet so that the cellos can jump in and you're playing on top of each other. And she said, and of course, this was again in North Carolina, we're a southern state. You know, she says, in the south, you're taught to be polite and you don't interrupt people, right? Don't you remember your mother telling when someone's talking, you wait your turn. So be polite and don't play while the other person's playing. And you know what? They fixed it. it was, she was what? Connecting to a schema. Polite conversation is where you don't interrupt the person before they're finished talking, it sort of helped them in their, in their playing. It was just a teacher using this natural thing called, this natural thing called connection. I was taking a golf lesson once, and the guy was teaching me the stance. You would think that it wouldn't be hard to learn the stance of a golf swing, but evidently it's very complicated, because he was teaching me how to put my feet. He said, put your foot here. Rotate your toe out 10 degrees, other foot here, 10 degrees, bend your knees, not that much, chin up, shoulders back, arms in front, bend at the waist, head up, chin. It was not working. I was thinking, man, I must be worse at golf than I think because I can't even stand. Right? I don't even have the stance right. He, he scratched his Chin for a moment, he said, he thought of a better way. He said, Mike, he goes, you got four kids, right? I said, yep. He goes, I bet you buy a lot of groceries. I said, we sure do. He said, have you ever done this? Have you ever gone to the grocery store and you have two bags of groceries in your hands, nothing left to shut the car door with but your backside? I said, yeah, I've done it. He goes, show me what that move would look like. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, grab the groceries. I got, I got them. He goes, now shut your car door. I went, boom. He said, put down the groceries, pick up the golf club. That's the stance, <laughs> right? It's like that. What did he do? He was, using, he was using connection. And you know, what? when he did that, I thought to myself, gosh, thanks, now I can use that. I can go out on the golf course, nobody needs to know what I'm thinking, right? I pull out my club, I'm going, <laughs> boom, down, you know? I'm ready to go. It takes so much more time to teach a new schema. That's how he started. He said, feet shoulder width apart toes out 10 degrees. I mean, he was teaching me from neuron one, connecting to neuron two, connecting to neuron three, and you can learn that way. But it's just so much faster if you can find something to, to connect back to. Um, so one of the talents that we look for in the classroom is whenever we see the teacher saying, it's just like this. If you want to understand how this works, think about how that works. That's called connection. That's schema building. It's an awesome talent to have. Do you think some teachers can be more talented in that skill than others? 
Some people are just great example providers, aren't they? In our, in our feedback workshop yesterday, we talked about a ninth grade physical science teacher who a student raised her hand and said, solids, liquids, and gases. I, I just don't understand liquids. I understand solids, and I understand how gases work, but I don't understand liquids. And the teacher looked up at the clock and said, in eight minutes, we're going to have a class change. You're going to go out in the hallway. And when you're in the hallway during a busy class change, that's a lot like a liquid. Because you're a molecule. You have other molecules right next to you. You're tightly packed. You're not in one specific place. You're going with the flow. But you have to stay inside the hallway. Take the shape of the container. That's what a liquid does. So he said, now right now, you're sitting in your assigned seat. That's like a solid. If you were to come back and see me after school today, and there's no one at the school, you could walk however way you wanted to and get back here. That'd be kind of like a gas. But a class change, that's like a liquid. And you know what? I thought to myself, nice connection. Because everyone can connect to what it's like to be in a busy class change. And I'm thinking that that student, that girl that asked the question, she learned how molecules uh, behave in a liquid quickly she'll be able to recall it without reviewing her notes and it'll transfer to when she takes chemistry in high school or some other advanced class. That's, that's one of the products of, uh, of, of connection. Your turn. Uh, with the one or two or three or four people at your table, just take a minute or two and let me just ask you to say, based on the definition, I've given you a few examples, give me some back. Some, you, now you're going to say, okay, I was in a classroom not too long ago and I saw this and I'm thinking that was a connection. I was in another classroom and I saw the teacher do this, and now I'm thinking that was a connection. See if you can come up with some real life examples. Of course, I just want your top of the head responses. I'm going to give you about 90 seconds. See what you can come up with. Go. Thank you very much. Let me ask you to hold on right there and let's just share a couple of quick examples. So we're, we're talent scouts. We're observing teachers work. We're looking at their moves and we're looking for examples of connection. Here's one. Let's go. When I teach music and the teacher students to observe the retard, the grass is going down, I tell them, you are trains, a train pulling into the station. You have many cars connected to each other under the direction of the conductor. If you don't slow down all the same time, the cars crash and they go away. Yeah. So as we're going along, the conductor says we are all slowing down together. Great. And now for every song that we do, yeah. there's a guitar. All I have to say train. I don't have to explain anything more, so no matter what song we're doing. Train is the PLT, PLE. Retard is the new curriculum. When you connect one to the other, here's what you get. They learn it faster, they recall it easier, like you said, and it transfers. You know, if you didn't get these three things in return, this wouldn't be a very good investment in time because it takes more time to teach to a connection, doesn't it? But you would say, as the teacher, you get the payoff, don't you? When you come up with a good connection. And then I'm able to then use it when we get to the which is a gradual increase speed together. So right. It's just, it's it is. Right. 
Plus, that sounds more positive, accelerando, rather than the other word that he used, right? You get in trouble for that. Yeah, good. Good example. That's awesome. That's a, that's a talent scout. That's spotting it. We need another. What's another example of connection? Nominate someone at your table that had one that you came up with. Oh, gosh, you must have had an awesome one. Go ahead and tell us what it was. I was a kindergarten teacher who was doing a phonics lesson. And she had the children equate the vowels of the letters in the middle sound. She said, L-O-V-E, which is a vowel. It would pan out, it would pan out, cat, cat, and it would blend the letters of the vowel with all the way to L-O-V-E. Good. It's one in the middle, right? Yeah. 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 So it's right there? Yeah. Yeah. And so here's something that you already know. You know about your arm. Right? And now I'm going to take sounding out multi- multiple syllabic words, the consonant, the vowel, the inconsonant. I'm going to connect it to what you already know. In doing it that way, do you think you saw some of the three? Speed, recall, transfer? You know, we're, we're saying, once, once they finish school, then we have a team that comes back in and will visit with the children. And the children were in the middle of the mouth with the speaker with the outside person. And they were going to that. Yeah. So when they recall. That's a good sign, yeah. Students are taking a quiz or doing something, you see them doing what you ask them to do. You know, a a guest conductor comes in and they're all going, train wreck, train wreck. What are you talking about? You're the only one that would know. Now, before we move on from connection, I do want to just quickly say, and it would be malpractice if I didn't point this out. Teachers who are really talented at this can sometimes be risky. Because do you see that when a student, in a student's mind, They're connecting the curriculum to a past learning or experience. If they make the wrong connection, they can have a misconception, right? And since this is an invisible process, right? I learned that from yesterday's session. They're visible and invisible processes. This is an invisible process, and so you never really know. What if a student had been aboard a train that derailed? You know, then the, 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 uh, the analogy would maybe cause them to think of something else, right, rather than, than what we're looking, looking at. So just remember that when a teacher uses connection, be careful and test your connection to make sure that it connected to the right, to the right thing. Fifth grade class, teacher came in on Tuesday, reviewed quickly from Monday and said, yesterday we worked on parallel lines. Who can tell me the definition of parallel lines so that we can build on that and go further in our geometry unit today? A little girl in the back row raised her hand very tentatively, very sheepishly, and said, she said, Mary, what's the definition of parallel lines? And Mary said, according to what I wrote down yesterday, parallel lines are, are two lines that do not have sex. Now, what do you think the teacher probably said on Monday that the student misinterpreted? Two lines that don't what? Intersect, right? So, do you see that in the student's brain, intersect and have sex is right next to each other. You have to really be careful about connections, or you could have a misconception that could last. I mean, that's going to make a very good... What did you learn in school today, honey, Mary? Yeah, that's, that's going to be, that's going to get a phone call to the SAM. That's what's going to happen to that, right? Let me do that. So, connection. Good. Good work. Let's look at, uh, let's look at locale memory. This is another one that got some snaps from you. And it's very similar. It's just a couple of notches down. And it fits into the same category of connection. Locale memory is an optimizer, which means that it's, uh, it's not required. We would never say to a teacher, you're not using locale memory every day. We would never say to a teacher, you're not using connection every day. You know, we could say to a teacher, you're not using clear learning goals every day, right? That's a fundamental. But these are optimizers. They're optional. Uh, Let's see. Locale memory is teaching to the brain's three-dimensional spatial memory system. It produces the same results as connection speed, recall, and transfer. In some ways, it's similar to connection. Think of it this way. We're looking at, it's called locale memory. You see this all the time in your classrooms. This is an awesome talent to spot and develop. It's fun to do. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So again, if you're taking notes, draw yourself a little memory cloud and and understand that memory in the human brain is redundant. The brain remembers things in different memory systems because memory is important, and so the brain does it in several ways so that you don't forget. It's kind of like an airplane has redundant 
systems for lowering the landing gear. If one doesn't work, there's another way. If that doesn't work, there's a third way. Because landing the plane is pretty important. You want to have redundant systems. Well, for your body to survive in the, the environment, your ability to remember the past and make decisions about the future is really important. So it makes sense that there are redundant memory systems. There are actually, neuroscientists tell us, about five redundant memory systems in the human brain. The two that we, mo that we know the most about are called taxon memory and locale memory. Taxon memory is when the human brain remembers things by category. The root taxon is taxonomy, or list, or category. So when you remember things in your taxon memory, you sort of pull out a file cabinet in your brain and you put things and you keep them separate into the separate files. Important bank numbers, like my PIN number, go right here. Uh, birthdays of my family, uh, anniversary, that goes in under important dates. Civil War facts maybe go here. Uh, you know, all those things are, those are all categories. So there's nothing wrong with teaching to locale or to tax on memory, but there is another very powerful memory system that operates redundantly, and that's called locale memory. And locale memory is when the brain remembers not by category, but by position, by three-dimensional space. Where was your body when you encountered this information? Not what part of my brain am I going to file it. Where were you? It's spatial memory. That's not special memory with a North Carolina accent. Spatial memory. That's spatial as in three-dimensional positions in space. So it's when teachers take what they want to teach and instead of connecting it to a category, they connect it to a place. The example that you gave was actually also, besides being a connection, that was a good example of locale memory, wasn't it? because the students are sounding out the, the consonant and vowel sounds by putting them in a location on your body. This is locale memory, figuring out how many days are in a month. Remember, January, February, March, April, May, you've got the information on your body. It's in a three-dimensional position in space. That's locale, that's locale memory. I, uh, let me give you a couple quick examples of locale memory. Um, let's see, I was, um, I was watching a teacher teach uh, population density. Uh, it was a high school uh, civics class. And the, the, the teacher took his class out onto the bus parking lot, which was marked off with lines. And they used the lines on the bus parking lot to simulate population density. So for a very dense population, like say Beijing, they put all the students in one, one uh, what would you call that? Uh, space, good, space. Doesn't have to be <laughs> spatial, space, that's right. And so they were all crowded together and he said, this, let's let this represent population density of Beijing. Then they said, now here's the population density of, say, Bloomington, Indiana, just a nice middle-sized town. Uh, in that case, there were like five students per space. Now here's the population density of the state of Wyoming, which there are only 55,000 students that go to school in the whole state of Wyoming. And so every student got three bus spaces to themselves. And I thought to myself, even though that's extra time and effort, they're not going to forget that. They're learning that in their spatial locale memory. They're not just putting it into a category called, what? Population density. So it, it ups the speed, it ups the recall, and it ups the, ups the transfer. Is anyone here uh, in the marching band when you're in high school? Any marching banders, bandies? You know, people who watch a good marching band at the halftime show of a, of a ball game say, wow, isn't that amazing that they can play and move at the same time? Here's what they don't understand. Your playing and your moving are connected, aren't they? And it's what keeps you together. When you cross the 35-yard line, that's when everyone hits, the, hits that note at the same time. If you were to stand and try to play it, it might not sound the same, or is, isn't that right, music? So your locale memory is how you're remembering that. Anyone here ever had any experience in theater? Been in any plays, acted a little bit? Well, then you know that your position on the stage is how you remember your lines, right? There are nine parts to a theater stage. Center, left, and right. Up, uh, upstage, downstage, center stage, right? And so you, if you're not in the right place, if you can't make it to this big rock with this palm tree, you cannot remember the words, I'm gonna wash that man right out of my hair, right? <laughs> in South Pacific, because the words are connected to the place, and if you don't get to the place, you can't remember the words. Here's what we know about locale memory. Locale memory is powerful. 
you can remember more information in your locale memory than you can in your taxon memory. You can remember the whole song to South Pacific. You couldn't remember that just in a category, a category of your brain, right? Um, locale memory can be very simple. I saw a teacher once doing greater than and less than, and she was teaching in a classroom that was very, very overcrowded. I don't even think this classroom was meant to be a classroom, but it was being used as one. There were maybe 30 students in there, and all she had them do was lean. She'd put two numbers up on the screen. She'd say, if the one on the right is greater than the one on the left, I want you to lean to the right, all right? Now lean to the left. And they were just adding a little bit of locale memory just by leaning one way, one way or the other. Um, taking notes is locale memory. It's not a lot. Here's a way to think about locale memory. The bigger the muscle groups involved, the more it's locale and the less it's taxon. So if you were to take notes on a post-it note, tiny little post-it note, just write down a few key words. You'd be using the smallest muscles in your body, right? Just the tiny little finger muscles. If you used an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, you've now got to make some decisions about where on the page you, you put that, right? That's, that adds a little bit of locale memory. If the teacher gives you a big piece of paper, you have to use a little bit bigger muscle group or maybe puts paper up on the wall where you have to go over and, and do things collaboratively with a big sheet of paper. The bigger the paper, the more locale memory. Anyone here ever lost your car keys? All right, what's the time-honored way to find your car keys? Retrace your steps. Retracing your steps is a locale memory strategy, right? And the reason you don't remember where your car keys are is because your taxon memory has failed you. Right? There's a category in your brain called, where did I leave my car keys? And you looked in there and nothing was there. And so then you said, well, let me use my redundant memory system. Now here's why I'm using this as an example. Tell me if I'm wrong. Almost always, you do not retrace your steps to your car keys. You retrace your steps to a locale that contains the memory of where your car keys are. So you're in the kitchen and you say, I've lost my car keys. And you walk in the dining room and you say, I've still lost my car keys. And you finally get to a place, you think you're following your way back to some other place, but what happens is you get to the back porch and you go, I left my car keys on my bedside table. And you go back and that's where they are. Different locations, what? They contain different memories. Don't look at me like that. Am I the only person who's ever been in the kitchen, walked into the pantry, and forgot why I came in here, right? <laughs> because I've changed locations. And you know, I know how I can remember, but I say to myself, I'm not gonna walk back into the kitchen just so I can remember why I walked into the pantry. That's an insult to my intelligence. So I sit there and go, what was it? What was it? What was it? And I can't think. And so then I walk back in, voila, there it is. And then I walk, has that ever happened to you? That's your locale memory being strong and your taxon memory being weak. Teachers who have a talent for locale memory know if I can embed it in three-dimensional space, my students are going to learn it faster, remember it, transfer it better. I've seen chemistry teachers uh, get students up and out of, them, out of their seats and do chemical bonding, right? So it's double replacement, single replacement, also using connection. I saw a chemistry teacher once do a prom drama where a couple went to the prom, had a fight dissolved their relationship. The girl found another boy who was slightly more electronegative than the first and bonded strongly with him. There were two then free radicals left over that spotted each other across the room and they bonded and so what we had was a double replacement reaction with no precipitate. <laughs> Which means, mom, <laughs> the girl I brought home isn't the one I took to the prom, but I like her better, right? That's what, that's what happens in double replacement. The kids remembered it, of course, because they were up and out of their seats. They also remembered it because it was a connection to something that was in their brain. It's a connection to prom. All right, we only have uh, just a couple of minutes left, so I want you to do one more round of uh, brainstorming. Give me back some examples. You've been in classrooms. You're giving feedback to teachers. Now you've got another term. Okay, now I see that was locale memory he was using. That was locale memory. See what you can come up with. 90 seconds. Go. Yep. Related to yeah, that's a little bit of locale memory. And the bigger the manipulatives, the better the locale memory. So moving stuff around a little bit is good. Moving it bigger places is better for memory. Getting up out of your seat and standing and saying, you stand in the tens column, you stand in the hundreds column is even better than 
just moving them from place to place on the, on the page. Thank you very much. Let me ask you to uh, hold on right there and share a couple of examples. Locale memory, it's a powerful talent to have. You know, often I'll sit in the back of a classroom and I'll see a teacher use this and I'll say, I don't know what's going on. And it's amazing how the students now remember it and can transfer it without reviewing it. And I'm thinking to myself, how did you think that up? Some people have a talent for thinking locale, right? Maybe they have a bodily kinesthetic intelligence. I don't know, but they, they just seem to be able to think these things up better. How about a couple of quick examples of where you've seen locale mini, memory? Cheryl, you've been a good contributor today. Years, Keep it up. years ago. Hold on. My bad. I'm sure I was in elementary school. A teacher came up teaching us the, the great lakes. She told us to use homes. And I tell you, I could do that today. This was 45, 50 years ago. I could still do it. H-O-M-E-S, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Area, period. That's the only way I know it. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Actually, uh, HOMES is in all acronyms. Uh, they are locale memory if there's a position there. If not, they're a connection, right? And connection and locale memory are very important. You're connecting the five Great Lakes to something that you already know. They're locale if the homes is in three-dimensional space. So like if it's H-O-M-E-S, if you're just doing it in your brain, it's taxon, but it's what? I'll go back. It's, that's a good example of connection, right? Connection and locale memory are very, uh, everyone in here knows all the ingredients to a Big Mac sandwich, don't you? To all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Because it's connected to, uh, to something that was already in your brain. It's a schema building. What's another example of locale memory? It's three-dimensional space. Thanks a lot. Here's one. You get the next one, Patricia. Um, I had a fifth grade teacher teaching further in the area this last week, and she used an index card. And on one side of the card, she had them write Ma and Pa. And we're gonna, uh, so she told them a story about how they were married, and they've been married for years and years. And for Ma, she wrote multiplication and an area, uh -huh. and then perimeter and add. And then she had holes around the card, and she gave them a pink piece of yarn. Yeah. And they had to lace around the outside. And she said, why? She said, because, and they all said, because the perimeter is around the outside. Then they flipped their card over and draw, drew a big head uh -huh. and a, a circle, which reminds them of area. Yeah. And then they drew hair as much. She gave 15 seconds to draw as much crazy hair as they could because then they had awesome. a connection with yeah. hairy area. I, and, um, hairy area. <laughs> and so they had that card as their note card to put in their notebook yeah. to remind them. Awesome. Good example of locale memory and of connection as well. Here's another example. Thank you. Anyone who's taking the quantum learning? Um, yeah. Several years a lot of good ago, examples. So I took it 10 years ago and I still remember uh, that they taught us over 
first 12 presidents of the United States just by adding colors and positions right. and just uh, different uh, words to describe the presidents. And right. so that was 10 years yeah. ago. You still remember it. That's, that's the power of locale memory. I don't know if you've ever read the book uh, Moonwalking with Einstein. It's kind of a new popular book. It's about the memory championships. There's an international and U.S. memory championship. So a journalist went inside to figure out how, how do these people remember. Like they'll give you a deck of cards in two minutes and you have to remember the sequence of the whole thing. And they can do it. And the way they do it is locale memory. The number one structure that all memory gurus use is called memory palace, which is you have a big house, palace with lots of rooms and you just walk from room to room and you put things in each room of the house and then even though it sounds like you can never remember it when you go back to the room there it is that's that's there waiting for you just shows you how powerful how powerful locale memory uh, is uh, now we have 23 themes I hope that as we work through them today I got a little bit you got a little appreciation of how they fit together we had time to look at two of the themes a little bit more in depth uh, the, what I'd share with you before we adjourn for the day is whether it's, can I hold up your card? Whether it's this lexicon or whether it's another one, here's what's important. That teachers and administrators have a common language to talk about teaching. Common language speeds up collaboration. Common language accelerates learning. Attorneys speak to each other in attorney speak and that helps them to communicate. Engineers talk to each other like engineers. Teachers and administrators should talk to one another like educators. So when you say that was a great example in your classroom, Cheryl, of locale memory, wouldn't it be great if the teacher knew locale memory is teaching to the brain's three-dimensional position memory, there's taxon, there's locale. When we share those understandings, it accelerates our ability to give feedback and our ability to work with one another and to build on, build on the talents that are, uh, that are there. If you'd like any more information on all of that, I put up here, uh, and it's on the bottom of your memory jogger and other things, our website. Uh, the website has a whole lot of free things to download. Uh, most of the things I gave you today are there. I think the article that was misprinted is there as a PDF file too. Just, just look over, it's, it's uh, rutherfordlg.com. LG stands for learning group, not large. Uh, and uh, if you go, if you have a Facebook account and you want to like Rutherford Learning Group, you'll get a periodic update when we publish something else, put up a new tip. What I try to do is go around from district to district and when I see some really excellent teaching, write it down and share it with other people as well. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, you might want to go and, and, uh, and check the like button there. Hey, it's been fun. Thank you for sticking around and working today. Have a wonderful rest of the, uh, rest, rest of the conference. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Good work. <laughs>